Good morning to our guests in the United States and good afternoon to everybody that is joining from Europe. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Wurz. I'm a board member at Atlantic Brücke and also a fellow with the Stiftung Mercato and I have the pleasure to moderate today's conversation. This is a uh, policy debate <clears throat> which brings together people that um, not usually talk to each other in a transatlantic environment and we are pretty excited to have a stellar panel and also an interesting issue to discuss. This discussion is part of what usually would have been the large German-American conference hosted by both our organizations that sponsor today's event, the Atlantic Book in Berlin and the American Council in Germany. Due to these crazy times we live in, uh, we are all looking at little video boxes on our screen. At the same time, we are able to reach interesting audiences and have uh, over 200 RSVPs for today's event. So we think um, we will have a chance to have a conversation which is interesting and inspiring. Let me very briefly introduce today's panel. We will start with Congressman Joaquin Castro from San Antonio. He's representing that district in Texas since 2013 and is also the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. He's a trailblazer for Latinos in foreign policy and is uh, very engaged in making sure that Latinos are not only part of the uh, electoral coalition in the United States, but as of next year, hopefully, um, they will part, uh, be a larger part of the governing coalition. Congressman, thank you so much for making time in your business, busy schedule. Um, Janet Morgia has been running the uh, National Council of La Raza since 2005. The organization has since been renamed in Uni Unidos US. She has been a trailblazer for civil rights in the Latino community. Her organization has been established in the context of the civil rights movement in 1968. It has over 300 member organizations all across the United States. And Janet is one of the more important voices in Washington and beyond when it comes to Latino issues. Um, for this reason, uh, our chairman, Sigmar Gabriel, when he did his first visit as uh, former vice chancellor to Washington, had a lengthy meeting with Janet and her staff at her office. And I'm really happy that we are initiating and uh, strengthening those conversations. So Janet, thank you so much for making time today. Thank you. Uh, Petra Bandel is a professor for political science. Uh, she is also the chairperson of the Expert Council on uh, Migration um, and a, a very important voice in the German conversations about the future of the immigration regime and about diversity in German society. Uh, professor Bandel, Bandel, thank you so much for being part of this panel today. Last not least, uh, Gemma Esdemir um, has been uh, elected to the Bundestag for the first time in 1994 as the first uh, a uh, member of the Turkish community that uh, made it into the German parliament. He has been a trailblazer in his own right. He was a co-chair of the German Green Party for over 10 years. He had a stint in the European parliament and he is a true transatlanticist, uh, uh, not only in political terms, but he got uh, married here in Washington at the shores of the Potomac River in a beautiful outside outdoors ceremony. So um, uh, the transatlantic bond is kind of written into his family history. James, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Congressman Castro, let me start with you and, uh, and ask you the first question. Um, as I mentioned, you have been very engaged in moving the Latino community into foreign and national security policy conversations. What has changed in the US uh, Hispanic community? Explain to our European listeners especially um, what you see as different than 10 or 15 years ago? And why is the community more interested in international affairs than this was the case maybe in the 1990s or the early years of the 21st century? Sure, well, first, Michael, I wanna say it's great to be with everybody. Uh, I look forward to this conversation. Uh, and you and I have spoken about this issue uh, repeatedly and how we get greater Latino representation in American foreign policy. And let me give a little bit of broader context to this. Uh, Latinos are now about 18 and a half percent of the United States population. So almost uh, one in five Americans are Latino, Latino Americans. And the, the community is often thought of as existing in the big states and cities. So uh, states like California, New York, uh, Texas, uh, in Chicago, in Miami, but more and more you see the Latino community uh, growing very quickly and strongly in states that many of us never thought of as having a Latino population, places like Nebraska, and Missouri, and Iowa, and so forth. Uh, and also Latinos moving into elective positions, communities uh, electing their first school board member or state representative or city council member. Uh, and then of course, the more established Latino communities 
like for example, my hometown of San Antonio or places like Los Angeles, there's a long history of civic participation and uh, political participation. But if you look at American industries almost across the board, the big industries, whether it's financial services, uh, media and entertainment, uh, healthcare, uh, at the highest levels of those industries, especially, uh, Latinos are, also, are, are usually woefully underrepresented. Uh, that is the same thing for the federal workforce that includes the State Department, for example. So Latinos are the most underrepresented group uh, versus their population in the federal workforce. Again, making up about 18 and a half percent of the country, but only about 8.6 percent of the overall federal workforce. So that gives you a sense of the work uh, that there remains to be done uh, in terms of getting Latinos into the federal workforce, but more specifically getting them into the foreign policy apparatus. And so I think uh, part of what has changed is a, really a vigorous effort to try to do that. Uh, in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, we've been working on this very issue uh, for the past few years, especially. Um, and I was very surprised to learn as somebody who's vice chair of our own Foreign Affairs Committee in the United States House of Representatives, that for example, right now at the State Department, there are only four Latino career diplomats uh, at the US State Department uh, and only a few African-Americans actually. And so there is an incredible amount of work to do to improve that diversity. One of the things that we started to do in Congress this year uh, is so that we could keep track of our own efforts is to measure the, the diversity of expert witnesses that are called in front of committees uh, so that we can see whose perspective we're drawing from uh, and who we need to attend to more. Uh, and that has been very successful and we're trying to get that put into the house rules. Uh, but also, you know, I had a, an op-ed in foreign affairs yesterday uh, where uh, one of the things I mentioned was the diversity of the State Department uh, and the need to make sure that everybody feels like they have an opportunity to have a chance at the State Department, to uh, get promoted at the State Department. And unfortunately, historically, that hasn't always been the case. And we need to do a better job as a nation, the United States uh, and the State Department needs to do a better job of making it so. Uh, so it won't happen uh, overnight. Uh, it's a years long process but I do think that we're headed in the right direction. People are paying attention to this issue. I think most of all, because we would like for our diplomats and our State Department to reflect uh, the diverse face of this country. Uh, and often over the years, that just hasn't been the case. And so we're gonna continue to work on this issue. Thank you, Congressman. And it's interesting that actually under Colin Powell, there was a big initiative in the State Department to make sure that the State Department looks a little more like the United States, especially when it had its first uh, African-American secretary. And it seems that we're still lagging behind. So with this in mind, um, Janet Morgia, let me ask you, um, what has changed from your perspective? It is interesting that we have discussions about the election that is going to take place next Tuesday, and all of a sudden the 7% Latino population in a state, important swing state like Pennsylvania is all over the press and people start paying attention. Obviously the race in Texas is very close uh, as a surprise to many. So they're direct political implication, but, uh, implications, but at the same, same time, do you think that the Latino community needs to push harder than it has in the last 10, 15 years, given the lack of success that the Congressman has just uh, described? Well, I, when you say push harder, you, I'm sorry, did you say push harder? Yes, yes that's what I said. Uh, on the electoral front? On the electoral front, but also when it comes to represent Latinos in government institutions, yeah. in businesses, because this that's has right. been part of your mission as, uh, yeah. as president that's, of Unidos US as well. That's right. And I want to thank you for inviting me and Unidos US to be represented in this important discussion. I know uh, Congressman Castro has been a champion on this front. So he's reflecting the important interests of having that representation by the Latino community in so many positions of influence that can help determine the future policies and direction uh, of, of the United States. So on the positive side, I would just say, there's no question as the Congressman points out, Latinos are now the largest racial ethnic group in the country. And uh, as the Congressman points out, we need to build on that representational population growth and see a much more consistent representation in these positions of influence. At Unidos US, 
we've been very invested in making sure that we're registering uh, more Hispanics and Latinos to vote and to encourage them to run for office. It's very important for us that we see that population percentage represented in our political influence and power. So in fact, 60% of Latinos are millennials or younger. And by 2030, we'll be one in three new entrants into the American job market. Our Hispanic buying power has grown to $1.7 trillion from $1 billion in 2010. And that's an increase in 70%. So we do need to see much more of that representational uh, uh, influence in terms of our political power. And I think it is happening. We're gonna see the largest turnout of Latino voters in our history, but we still have barriers that are created uh, in the system to having that access to full political power. And that's part of voter suppression efforts, a lack of engagement by political parties and sometimes candidates themselves to engage directly uh, with our community. And so Unidos US, we have focused on not only making sure that we're engaging our network, those 300 community-based organizations, their leaders and, and the communities that come through their doors, but to make sure they're connected, not just to services and programs on the ground, but to information and, and knowledge that will help them understand to connect what their circumstances are on the ground to the importance of the electoral process and to holding elected officials accountable for the policies that impact their lives. So advocacy and issue advocacy has been an important dynamic in terms of our work beyond programs and services that many of our families need on the ground. We are connecting that to their voice and their vote as they look at the impact of many of these policies and understand that they can hold these elected officials accountable. So we're part of that civic engagement process. And many of those families are uh, understanding more clearly that they can have a say in the outcomes of these policy discussions and what's happening in their lives. And so we're eager to continue to build on that kind of civic engagement process with our community because we've seen firsthand states like Arizona 10 years ago had a, uh, a very anti-Latino, anti-immigrant policy. And 10 years later, those uh, efforts uh, to combat that policy have now led to the growth of a cohort of leaders in Latino leaders in Arizona that are now gonna turn the corner for the future director trajectory of Arizona. And I think that's emblematic of what's happening in other states and can happen nationally when our Latinos become engaged in the process and actually run for office. And you need only look at the Castro brothers as a prime example of how that can happen. Starting at the local level, connecting the situational circumstances of our families to policy and to representation, and then ultimately being in leadership positions to help guide the national policies that are at stake. Thank you, thank you so much, Janet. And, and very briefly, as a follow-up question, if I may, the Latino community still has the lowest voter participation rate in the United States. Um, what is the strongest argument that you make when you engage with your large organization in uh, civic affairs? What is yeah. the best uh, pitch that you can make to the Latino community, besides all the issues that you have mentioned, including voter suppression, for getting more engaged in the political process? Well, one thing we need to do is to correct uh, one notion around that uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is, is that when our community is registered to vote, they vote at comparable levels of their white or, or black peers. The challenge has been in engaging voter registration efforts, which oftentimes require resources and a very strong intentional effort by parties and candidates mm -hmm. and by, I would say, civic entities. Our organizations need to be funded to do more of that work. 
but it requires re re resources. But what we do know is that when our community is registered, the registered voters in our community will vote at 83% or higher, which mm -hmm. is often comparable to other communities. The difficult challenge is the gulf between those Latinos who are not registered and then those who are registered. And we all need to be very invested as a society in voter registration efforts. And there've been a lot of barriers and lack of resources related to engaging all communities, but in particular, the Latino community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Bendel, um, how does the European and the German experience uh, relate to what you have just heard about the United States? And if you may, could you share some of your observations of the transformation of the labor market that is going on in the European Union and will require indeed uh, more immigration, which is obviously generating a very, very complicated political debate in your home country? That's right. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me um, and learn from these very uh, interesting and challenging experiences you, you have shared with us. Um, certainly, I think uh, that Germany and also Europe can uh, indeed and should uh, learn quite a lot from the traditional immigration countries like the United States of America. And one of the things we can certainly learn is to foster migrants representation in the German parliaments in all the political levels. I mean, in the, in the German Bundestag, only 8.5% of the elected representatives um, have a migration history. Uh, so this is only 58 out of 700, currently 709 elected representatives, uh, while their total share in the German population amounts to uh, around 26%. Uh, percent and their share in eligible voters is around 12.5 percent. So political parties, I think, are of course here the gatekeepers and they should be aware uh, of the rising number of persons with an immigration background uh, in the, uh, in the uh, years to come, uh, also among the German uh, population um, and representing an important part of the, uh, of, of the voters. Um, so uh, you've asked me about the changing from integration issues maybe towards uh, migration issues. Well, that, that's what you asked me for. Um, I would like to focus on Germany because it's a very specific and a very specific uh, situation even among the, the European countries. Um, Germany, as you might know, had for decades been hesitant to, uh, to recognize that it had already long uh, evolved into being a country of immigration. But, but this changed uh, around 20 years ago with the uh, red and green um, government. Um, and of course, demographic change um, is an important fa factor in that. Uh, demographic needs in our aging populations uh, population have become more and more evident in the past years and in the years to come, a growing number of skilled workers will, will be withdrawing from working life. So this means that in the next five years, um, around uh, 1.8 million people uh, will be lacking in the labor force. And this decline is particularly relevant uh, for the health sector, of course, but also for law, for uh, management, economy, in computer sciences, engineering, and natural science, but also in other areas. Um, have you ever tried, for instance, to find a plumber to repair your bathroom in Germany? Or have you ever tried uh, to find medical personnel in order to nurse your parents? So this is really, really becoming very difficult. And then uh, it was, of course, the Chamber of Crafts and Industry who pressed most for a reform of the, uh, of the immigration law. Um, because in many enterprises, capacities um, are already and sometimes even permanently overloaded and investments uh, have been decreasing. So six out of uh, 10 enterprises identify workforce shortage as their main risk. And although there have been different approaches as to how to attract skilled labors among the political parties in the German par parliament, for instance, uh, the Greens opted for a point system uh, like the former Canadian one, uh, there still was a consensus among the political parties and political groups that an immigration law was overdue. And although migrants uh, and particularly refugees have been most hardly hit uh, or affected by the COVID 
2019 pandemic, um, even during the COVID-19 uh, period, Germany desperately uh, needs skilled and even unskilled uh, workers. Uh, on the contrary, COVID-19 uh, clearly demonstrated that we need immigration, especially in the so-called system systemically relevant professions, that is in agriculture, in food uh, sector, in the food sector, in energy supply, uh, sales and retails, and again, particularly in health and care services. Um, until now, Germany uh, had been benefiting from intra-EU mobility. However, the influx from the EU uh, skilled migrants from other EU countries is declining and has been declining in the, in the past few years. And this is why third country migration, we call third country, uh, the non-EU uh, mi migrants. Um, so why uh, third country migration into the labor market is highly welcome now. The new immigration act um, for those of you who, who, who uh, speak German, it's Fachkräfte Einwanderungsgesetz, one of these longish German words, uh, entered into force in March. So it was directly when the first um, lockdown took place. And um, so it couldn't really, um, well, it uh, directly aims at attracting migrants from non-EU countries and is therefore a step into the right, right direction, of course. Um, maybe just to briefly sum up what is new, until March, uh, only highly qualified persons with an academic background and qualified specialists for, from very limited uh, understaffed professions had been eligible to obtain residence. Uh, this has now changed. In principle, the new bill maintains the necessity to present first an employment contract before being allowed to enter the country. And this requirement tries to guarantee that immigration um, is closely linked to the changing necessities of the German labor market. Also, the job agency has to confirm that the applicant's qualifications co correspond to the requirement of the job. So the main orientation of the bill is still basically demand driven. However, one new and interesting element is possibly um, to enter Germany when um, is the possibility to enter Germany when in search for an employment for the duration of six months. That means without um, presenting an employment contract in advance. But this still requires uh, the proof of appropriate language proficiency. And I'll, I, I'll get back to that later for the respective job. The possibility has, has only been valid for highly skilled uh, before, but what the bill does basically is now to adjust the possibilities for skilled workers to those of the highly skilled. Um, so in the German Expert Council you mentioned uh, on integration and migration, we have called that the end of the academic arrogance. Um, what are our problems then? Uh, I would briefly identify three. Um, um, and one of the main problems we have in Germany, uh, of course, is the German language. Or as several experts uh, I interviewed and who preferred to, to work in other countries rather than in Germany, um, they told me life is just too short to learn German. So um, also the new bill has maintained the requirement to prove that your training acquired abroad is equivalent to the German system. However, the so-called dual training system that we have that combines specialized school training and practical training on the job is so particular and does not mean meet equivalence in most of, of the other countries. Um, and this is the central barrier on the job market to obtain eligibility if you come from abroad. And on top of the Immigration Act itself, uh, we need to expand also our administrative system, the diplomatic missions and agencies abroad, as well as our immigration authorities in the interior, because we know that uh, in some diplomatic missions, it takes you months even to ob obtain the first appointment. So being more flexible and more courageous uh, when attracting labor force from abroad is something I think we should learn from the United States. And I leave it at that. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bendel. Um, Jamir Demir, um, over to you last uh, but not least. Uh, 
you uh, have been engaged in foreign affairs early on in your political career. Uh, in comparison with the United States, a country that you know well, uh, where do you see, see things going? And maybe you can also share a few thoughts about how minority representatives in governments, but also in foreign affairs, could help to rebuild the transatlantic alliance and to, to a certain degree reconstitute the West, uh, the task that is imminent and important after the four years that we have lived through here, should there be a new US government. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, hola, hi, uh, dear Michael. First of all, thanks uh, for having me. It's a big pleasure to have those kinds of discussions because unfortunately, uh, these days, uh, because of the current situation, we tend to discuss inside our national borders. And I'm very thankful that this gives us at least a short uh, moment of uh, thinking beyond our own national borders and, and countries. Well, um, let me start by saying, when I entered national politics in 1994, as you introduced me uh, as the first member of parliament from a so-called guest worker family, whose parents moved to Germany as so-called guest workers in the 60s, it was, first of all, something that was very much linked to the so-called progressive parties. So it was clear if you were a person of color, uh, if, you're, if your parents are working in a factory, your, your parents are organized in unions, and it's very logical that you end up either in the Social Democratic Party or then later on in the Green Party or in the Left Party. That has changed. Today, we have representation of people of color practically in all democratic parties, maybe except for the extreme right-wing party, the AFD party, but even they have some people of color in order to use them uh, as, as uh, you know, examples or as, as people uh, that prove you know, that we're doing things wrong. So to make a long story short, the first member of a state government was from the Christian Democrats from the Turkish community, not from my own party, although we were the first ones uh, bringing people of color into mainstream politics. That's, I think, good news that it is now not anymore linked to the so-called progressive parties, all parties. We have now a uh, inter-party inter group in the German Bundestag on diversity and anti-racism, where all parties are represented except for the AFD party. It was founded after we had some racist attacks uh, in the city of uh, Halle and Hanau. And we're trying to uh, make sure that this group continues to work after the next election beyond party lines. And we believe that's very important. And another observation in comparison to the US is uh, the Turkish community. And I, I'm pretty sure that's uh, more or less the, the, the case for a lot of communities is as diverse as I guess the Latino community in the US is. So, as there is no one single Latino community who has one view about the upcoming presidential elections in the US, it's the same here. And it's very much di uh, divided alongside what you think of President Erdogan. One part of the community admires him, thinks he's kind of the new prophet, and the other side of the community thinks he's evil. So you can imagine it's very hard to assemble these people and say, you know, we might disagree on what our views are vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan, but let's agree on the future of our children. Let's agree on fight against racism. Let's agree on good schools and so on. That's very difficult meanwhile. Uh, it was much easier in the past, but today, uh, unfortunately, the role of Erdogan, the role of the Putin factor within the uh, Russian-speaking community in Germany is a very, very crucial one. The same is unfortunately true uh, for the sources of information. I mean, imagine we live in one country, but some people has a, have, have as the main information source media from Turkey or media from Russia. Of course, telling a completely different story about uh, events taking place in this country. By the way, uh, uh, this is also a big challenging situation for us uh, in, in uh, treating uh, COVID-19. Because, you know, if you want to reach out uh, to migrant communities, this is something uh, where you have to go sometimes over Ankara or over Moscow in order to reach out to some communities. Mm -hmm. So these are, uh, to sum up the challenges uh, that we're facing right now, 
And then, of course, and this is uh, sad news, uh, one of the reasons why I entered uh, national politics in, in the beginning of the 90s was uh, there were some racist attacks vis-a-vis -vis the Turkish community, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, refugee communities, uh, both in former Eastern Germany and, and West Germany. And that was a motivation for me to say, I, I want to be represented in the national parliament as a person who speaks the language of those people who get burned and who get attacked by right-wing uh, extremist, uh, ex extremist Nazis. And that was a time when we had some optimism saying, you know, that is in the future and it will not happen again. Meanwhile, if I look back, we had a right-wing terrorist group called the NSU uh, who murdered for 10 years uh, people of color, uh, in particular from the Turkish community, but also a German police officer and somebody from the Greek community. And we had huge difficulties. And that's something, you know, we Germans tend to finger point on the US when we talk about racism and police. Uh, we had to witness that we also had our difficult moments with, within our intelligence, within our police sometimes, unfortunately. And these are the topics we're addressing right now. So first of all, what is our relationship to the country in which we live? And how do we define the relationship to the country where our forefathers come from? And the second topic is, how do we define an umbrella that unites our country? Is it based on our constitution? Is it based on history? What is it that unites us in this country? And how do we make sure that we have equal chances for everybody starting from kindergarten to university and to workspace and whatever? And at the same time, how can we fight racism? Thank you, Jem. And I'll ask uh, Janet Morgia and Congressman Castro to react to what you've said. And I will combine this with a number of questions that have come in from the audience uh, in the meantime. Janet, I'll start with you. There were two questions uh, with regard to something that Jem already has mentioned, the incredible diversity of the Latino community. Uh, they are Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Central Americans, Brazilians, at least a few Brazilians, a uh, large community, increasing community from the Caribbean. Um, the, the question is, how are their interests different? And maybe if I can add on to that, um, do you see something like a consolidation of these different communities as Hispanics because they are being attacked because of their color of skin? What is your, if you measure the temperature on where Latinos stand on being from certain countries versus being Hispanics in the United States, where do you come down on this? Yes, well, uh, thank you for the question. I know the Congressman will want to respond as well, but, but I think it's fair to say what we all know and have known in our own community, but others are still learning, and that is we are not a monolithic group. We have uh, different interests based oftentimes on our country of origin. Uh, there's no question about that, that there are differences in in the views of Cuban Americans versus Mexican Americans uh, versus uh, many of our communities that come from Latin America and, uh, and of course, Puerto Rico. So they are not all aligned in the same, but we do have a lot that brings us together beyond oftentimes the, the language, uh, even culturally, there is a consensus around importance of issues that we at Unidos US have really focused on. And that is, you know, all of our uh, community cares about the future of their families and, and children. So issues like education and access to health care and housing and jobs and a strong economy become issues that we can uh, consolidate around. And it is true that language and cultural competencies become a bridge for us across all of our communities. But obviously we do have uh, distinctions and uh, a lot of times we're seeing uh, more often than not most recently, some trying to create a wedge uh, within some of our communities. We're seeing that play out in this election and in the campaigns in Florida and South Florida, where we have a large Cuban American, Venezuelan American population, and you're seeing uh, many on on the on the uh, in the Trump campaign stoking 
uh, and uh, against the Biden, uh, Biden and his campaign, a, a, a socialist message because they believe it will resonate more with Cuban Americans and Venezuelan Americans. Uh, it's a very targeted and micro-targeted strategy with a lot of disinformation, but uh, unfortunately we're seeing how it can work to divide our community, but there's much more that unites us mm -hmm. in terms of our language, our culture, and our interests for a vision for the future that re respects diversity and is a very inclusive one. Thank you so much for pointing this out. And I think, as you say, it's important for politicians to reflect that I still remember in the 2008 um, campaign when Barack Obama gave uh, one speech in Texas and the same day he went to California. And in Texas, his emphasis was on family, tradition, social ties. And then in Los Angeles, he talked about himself as being the son of a first of, a, of an immigrant, right? I mean, so he could he could go through this metamorphosis of, of representing the different experiences of the community. Congressman Castro, um, tying this also into the foreign policy uh, discussion, um, there's a very interesting question from Patrick who says, what is the foreign policy difference that Congressman Castro sees as missing as a result of the lack of Latino representation? So going beyond the pure question of, can we represent America yeah. better in its diversity? But what is your added ben what is the added benefit that, that Latinos bring on when they're engaging in national security and foreign policy? Well, I'll give you a, a just kind of a glaring example uh, and a gaping hole is that we don't, the Congress doesn't pay enough attention to the Western hemisphere. Uh, there are things that happen in Latin America that if they happened in another part of the world would get a lot more attention from the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Uh, and I'll give you a concrete example of that. Uh, since the summer of 2014, there have been about a million, mostly women and children, who have come to the United States border from the Northern Triangle countries of Central America and mostly seeking asylum. And in the House of Representatives, uh, we have had one hearing, I believe, which has touched on that a bit and had to do with US assistance uh, to Latin America. Uh, but that is about it uh, in those six years where you've got a million people, uh, one, one partial hearing that has dealt with this issue. So to me, that's an example of, you know, of the effects of not having full Latino representation in Congress, but also I think full Latino representation in the State Department, mm -hmm. uh, that these issues that are huge issues uh, with nations not too far from the United States would not get the full accounting that they should. Uh, and briefly, another question that just came in, what are some specific ways to increase representation of the Latino community uh, at the state level, specifically in the Midwestern and Southern states? It was a question directed to you, Congressman. That's a great question. You know, I know that you spoke earlier and Janet addressed the issue of uh, Latino voter participation. And I would say a similar thing in terms of uh, particip electoral participation, getting candidates to run for office, for example, whether it's in the Midwest or another community. What has happened too often in American politics is that campaigns have only targeted uh, consistent voters or likely voters, mm -hmm. uh, and they only engage people who have already availed themselves of the political process. Well, you have a lot of Latinos and Latinas who have either never, there are often, it's a young population, uh, have never voted before or voted inconsistently. And so those folks over the years are the ones that are not getting people coming to their door to knock on their door to ask them to vote. They're not getting the mail outs that flood all of our mailboxes for those of us that are consistent voters. They're not getting the phone calls or now the text messages that are sent by campaigns. And part of what is shifting is now because fundraising and political campaigns in the United States, and I suspect throughout the world, uh, fundraising is so much more democratized. People are raising tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in small dollar contributions. So now there's more money in American politics to do more things. And part of that fortunately has meant reaching out to groups that have not traditionally participated at the same level in American politics. And I think Janet was right. I think people don't participate not because they're lazy or because they're disinterested, but because they have in their mind almost the medical ethic, the doctor's ethic, which is do no harm. If I don't understand what the candidates stand for, or I feel like I don't have enough information uh, to make an informed decision on who to vote for, then I'm just going to step back and not make the wrong decision. Uh, and I, I mean, I've done the same thing, even as somebody who is 
very well educated on candidates and everything where uh, there's a, a race for a school board or something else. And I just don't know anything about the candidates and I'll leave it blank. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been the same, I think, scenario for a lot of Latinos. Uh, and then finally, we are seeing more Latinos and Latinas run for office. Uh, there are great organizations like Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and others that have worked very hard to try to recruit people over the years to run for all of those many seats, uh, including in places like the Midwest. Great. Yeah, um, if I could just build on that real quick. Go ahead, uh, I would just say a, a couple of things. One is, you know, one of our latest polls that we did in information shows that nearly one out of two registered Latino voters has reported that they've not been contacted by either party or a candidate running for office. Well, that lack of direct engagement to, in, you know, leads to this phenomenon that uh, the Congressman talked about. They need to be intentional about recruiting and engaging and doing outreach with our community because candidates matter, their positions matter, but you know, their knowledge of, of, of who stands for what and, and the fact that they can engage better Latino voters is important. And just one last thing, I come from a very non-traditional state of Kansas. And many of you know about Kansas, maybe from the movies in, in Dodge City. Well, Dodge City is now 50% Hispanic and the state capital of Topeka is represented by a Latina mayor. And so I just would tell you that it is changing. We are seeing more of our community from non-traditional states, not only populate those states, but actually run for office. And Unidos US, Naleo, LULAC, there's so many organizations that are now focused on helping make sure that they are getting access to information so they can run for offices at the local, state, and national, federal level. Thank you. Um, that's a very important point. Jem uh, Özdemir, let me ask you the following, and this also relates to a couple of questions that came in. Um, the reputation of the United States uh, in Europe, or probably in other parts of the world uh, as well, over the four years, for the last four years, has suffered tremendously. Um, there is not only um, pity, but there's also open resentment. Um, many European partners felt uh, legitimately attacked. There were questions about uh, the US loyalty to NATO. There was an economic war, trade war going on. If you think about the impact that the uh, last four years have had on German-American relations, what is a specific added benefit that a greater degree of minority participation in foreign affairs and Latinos and Asian Americans and Africans Americans uh, also being part of the transatlantic conversation. Could that help to reinitiate a discussion about what America is about, uh, modernize the perception of the United States in, in Germany? What do you think are ideas that we could work on to figure out a way to uh, develop something like transatlantic relations 2.0 uh, based on a new understanding, but also with new interlocutors and new actors? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, let me say, uh, it's not that long ago. I remember when I was uh, traveling to the US, I was meeting to uh, former La Raza, now Unidos US, and, and with good friends there. Uh, I always came back, you know, with those examples telling here to our communities, look at the US, this is such a great example. So, you know, of course, if you look from today's standpoint, unfortunately, we have a mixture of the, the policies of uh, coming from the White House and some traditional anti-Americanism that is mixing up. But I'm not that pessimistic that we can change that again. You know, I remember in previous years, uh, there were delegations coming from the U.S. to Germany and to European countries of uh, Muslim umbrella organizations in the U.S., and we were extremely astonished listening to them when they were telling us we were Americans. We belong to that country. We're loyal to the U.S. and we're Muslims. The same thing to imagine in Germany is much more difficult, you know, that you say I'm a Muslim and I'm a German. I'm a member of this parliament and I'm coming from a Muslim family. That's much more difficult to imagine. So, you know, the very history of the U.S. still matters, and independent from, from the current the dark periods that the U.S. is going through. So I'm not that pessimistic uh, if I cross fingers that the U.S. is coming back 
to the West and then coming back to, to <laughs> Western values and then everything that the US, by the way, taught us. Let's not forget that. It's the US that taught my country after Second World War and helped us to be anchored in the West, to be anchored in, in Europe and to be anchored in NATO. So uh, let, let us you know, have some optimism. Uh, there's still so much to learn from that fabric in the US, how to become American. One of the things that, that I told my children when I was in Washington at the Lincoln Memorial, just listening to people there when they stand there, people of color telling their children, this is our country. This is the man you know, who uh, went to war against slavery and so on. And I always came back to Germany and asked myself, what is the story I can tell my children in order to tell them, you know, what makes them German? What unites us in this country? Because we're not a traditional country of immigration. Uh, we have to create that now. Uh, Petra was telling us ab about uh, immigration law and about these kinds of things that we were discussing. Just have in mind, it was the year 2000 in Germany when we established birth rights. That is that a, a child that is born in Germany is not by birth anymore a foreigner. I was born in this country, raised in this country. My German was always better than my Turkish, but I was uh, the first 18 years of my life, I was a foreigner in this country. I was not a citizen. I had to apply for citizenship. I had to prove that I'm able to read and write, although I was uh, you know, finishing German schools, not Turkish schools. So we changed that. And when we changed that, where do we look to? We look into the US. We take the US as an example for birthrights that children are citizens. So maybe this is the time that the US looks a bit more to Europe. There is all, sometimes all, all, some, some things that maybe we do good now uh, in integrating and you know we should see this as a two-sided thing, learning from each other. Uh, there's still a lot I believe that is going on in the US states on the local level that we can learn from. Congressman Castro, um, let me ask you for a brief follow-up. Um, you see that there's somebody more optimistic about the United States than maybe many of, maybe many of us are, which is uh, very, very uh, heartening to see. Um, it, what is the strongest argument if you're talking with, uh, with people, uh, not only in the Biden campaign, but also in the Democratic Party more broadly, and you say you need to be aware of the fact that it is important to have Latinos in high level executive positions, not only in the traditional areas of human health and, and social issues or immigration or education, but also in national foreign security policy. Um, based on what Jem has described, is, is there a strong argument to be made that there is something that is beneficial to the national interest at large of having a greater diversity? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's also a danger and a cost to a country not fully understanding each segment of its population. And I want to tell you what I mean by that, because I think it's a foundational challenge for the Latino community in the United States. And I believe other communities in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a quick story. Michael, you know, at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, we've been doing a lot of work on diversity and inclusion across industries. Uh, we met with the Association of American Publishers to talk about publishing houses in this country. One of the people on the Zoom call was a publisher, a CEO of one of the top five publishing companies in the country and one of the largest publishing companies in the world. They publish textbooks for schools, fiction, nonfiction. At one point, I asked this gentleman, uh, I, I asked him whether he could name three Latinos or Latinas who had made significant contributions in American history, uh, three historical figures. Uh, again, this is a population that's almost 20% of the country and been here for generations now. And after five or 10 seconds, uh, this man, he said, um, uh, no, uh, I can't. Uh, and that speaks to the fact, but the thing is, if you ask probably 90% of Americans that same question, they would probably give you the same answer. Uh, that is a foundational problem for a group of people because your history and your story is being left out of American history textbooks, state history textbooks, the narrative of who you are as a group of people, your contributions to the success, to the prosperity of a nation are not being told in the writing of the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason I say that there's a cost to this 
is because that 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 misunderstanding leaves you more vulnerable to the stereotypes in American media and also the hostile political rhetoric that has come over the last four years. Mm. And in that worst iteration of that worst nexus between the two, you get what happened in El Paso, Texas last summer, where a madman drove 10 hours to kill 23 people because he saw them as Hispanic invaders to Texas. And so there's a lot of work to do uh, in, in getting the narrative out there of the positive contributions of this community uh, and the historic uh, and significant figures who have made contributions to the country. Um, and I think that will go a long way also in helping to diversify a lot of these industries, uh, including our foreign policy apparatus, our federal government, and all of it. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brandl, there's a, there's a question here in the, uh, in the chat from Alan Post, which is interesting and which I'd like to direct uh, towards you. He says, uh, in uh, Germany, is the term Ausländer for foreigner still a derogatory term as it was in the 1980s when I visited many times on business? And maybe connecting this to something that Congressman Castro uh, just said, to which degree when you are in your meetings in the uh, expert council and you're trying to figure out the future of the German uh, migration regime or the European mi migration regime, to which degree the United States serves as a backdrop for discussions or doesn't that come up at all? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yes, the, you're very right. Uh, the, 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 the term Ausländer or uh, foreigner um, is and is still and has been uh, regarded as derog derogatory. And uh, that is why it has in, in, in several uh, public uh, political debates and even in, in media discourses, uh, to a certain degree been replaced by the term um, mentioned with Migrationshintergrund, that is persons with a migration background. So this is a very complicated term. And what does it even mean? I mean, it is a statistical term it has been introduced by statistical um, means and in order to find out how many people do actually have a migration background and migration history. Um, and this is, has been defined as the persons uh, who came themselves or one of whose parents uh, has, been, has migrated. But then it, it is also being applied to people who uh, have, a, have an uh, obvious, uh, in, in, the, in the media, uh, an, an obvious non-German uh, physical, uh, like if they know as if they were visible minorities. So this term has also been applied in a very negative way in the, in the last time, in the, in the last um, um, even years, I would say. So it is very complicated to find a good term uh, that really, I mean, like you, like you have the debate, I mean, on racism in the United States, of course, um, as well, uh, when are you allowed to call a person a black person? Um, um, who is allowed to call a person a, a people of color, a person of color? Um, is that only the persons of color that are allowed to to define themselves as that. So it, it is very, it is really complicated. And to a certain debate, I, I feel that language is also uh, shows you our uncertainty sometimes to treat with all these topics. Um, with regard to the, to the German Expert Council, um, and I see Janet is, would, would like to, to add something on that. Maybe I, I um, yeah, I'll do that later. I, I yeah, if you don't mind, Professor, I would just want to add, because I think it builds on what you're saying, but I would hope that we could see a refocus on immigrant integration. I think it, it refers a lot to what Jem was saying, in that uh, we've had historically a very uh, strong um, uh, effort 100 years ago when we saw that the last turn of the century, the last wave of immigrants, an effort by the country and importantly by philanthropy to invest in settlement houses, to invest in engaging these immigrants in the, in the same way that our organization historically through our community-based organizations, uh, you know, 75% of them in, in our network do immigrant integration work like teaching immigrants English or helping them uh, navigate the different systems including access to citizenship it's been piecemeal since that turn of the century. 
Uh, but I think what we saw was that you were able to see many of those uh, cohorts of immigrants fully integrate uh, over a generation, maybe not even two generations, fully into society. And I would just say a more robust public-private immigrant integration effort is most arguably one of the most successful we could see happen. And, and one last point on, on my end, I would argue for Germany in particular, not only to do more in the area of immigrant integration, but also to consider allowing immigrants there an opportunity to become fully German. What has strengthened our country is the fact that as we have integrated immigrants, as they have access to citizenship, they feel more ownership in the future of the country. And that has been leveraged in the past in a very positive way. And I know it's a sensitive issue for different countries. I've traveled to Japan and to Spain and spoke about this, but I do believe that that is something that in this extraordinary moment where we're seeing the needs for labor forces and the needs in, the, in terms of the lack of population growth uh, and replacement populations to be thinking in bolder and newer ways. So I would just wanted to build on what the professor and Jim and the congressman were saying that way. Thank, thank you very much, Janet. And, and Jim, you'll be, you'll be, let me just say one brief thing. We have only two minutes left. So mm -hmm. I'll ask Jim to chime in. Also, uh, maybe say a few words about a question that came in that there was a lot of discussion about German issues and solutions, but whether there were also broader European solutions uh, and whether you were optimistic that the EU uh, has uh, the capacity to pro provide any solutions. So Jim, if you could kind of include a few words about this in your sure. response, and then I'll uh, give the last word to the Congressman to talk uh, very briefly about his expectations with regard to next Tuesday. And should there be a change in government, um, what his uh, big three asks will be to the president-elect Joe Biden if he, when he has a chance to speak to him. So Jim, first over to you. Well, I try to be very brief because I want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say very, very difficult on the European level because we have completely different uh, histories, you know, regarding the 27 member states of, uh, of the European Union. Just think of those latecomers into membership from Eastern Europe. Uh, for them, becoming a nation state was something very, very much you know, they were fighting for. And for them, it's very hard to imagine, you know, to be an open society with accepting refugees. For us, this is a his, this part of our history. It's part of our obligation from the Second World War. So there we have huge challenges within the European Union. I would like to stop and answering that here because that would lead us to a second discussion and just add briefly, I, I thought what Janet said was a very strong message, and let me add to that, but let people decide how they define themselves. I don't see a need, you know, that we as, as members of parliament, uh, that governments decide what people, which words they have to use to describe themselves. We're, we're in the process, uh, as Petra has described that, what matters more to me is, you know, that we're Germans, we're Europeans, and people have hyphenated identities. What we should talk about is, do we share the same constitution? Do we share the same values? Do we share enlightenment and so on as the basic? And build on that basic, let people create their own hyphenated identities and accept that. Thanks. Thank you. Congressman, uh, the last word is yours. All right, well, thank you. And uh, I always remind folks that the United States became the most prosperous and powerful nation on earth because it was a nation of immigrants, uh, because it was blessed to have people from every corner of the earth coming here. Uh, and then to answer your question about the three asks, I've been so busy with the campaigns that I had to wait, wait what are we gonna ask for? Uh, no, well, first, I think on behalf of all Americans, but also on behalf of Latinos that have been the group that has been hit the hardest by this pandemic, by COVID-19. Uh, of course, we asked the president, that we would ask the new president to focus on ridding us of this pandemic, which other countries have just about done, but the United States under Donald Trump has not. Uh, again, over 225,000 Americans have now died because of it. Uh, and then secondly, uh, what I've said, what I've actually spoken to the, to the vice president about already and his leadership uh, is the need for a true reformer at the Department of Homeland Security. 
Uh, we have witnessed over the last four years human rights abuses uh, committed on United States soil uh, by people associated with the federal government against women and children who have been asylum seekers here. And just this morning, the Biden campaign announced that they were going to, uh, something we suggested, create a task force to reunite the children who are separated uh, from their parents, uh, which is great news. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, uh, another thing would be on health care. Uh, you know, Latinos are the population that has the least percentage of health care coverage in the country. So we need to move closer to universal health care coverage in this country. And obviously, the issue that we've been talking about is diversifying the federal workforce, making it look like uh, the rest of the country so that it reflects the face of the nation. Thank you very much to uh, all of the panelists, Professor Bendel, Jana Murgia, Congressman Castro, Jem Esdemir. Uh, we know your time is valuable. We really appreciate that you spend an hour with us. Uh, I certainly hope this won't be the last discussion that we are having. Uh, let's uh, reassemble after November 3rd and uh, take uh, a new measurement of where US politics and the transatlantic uh, environment might be moving towards. Thank you very much again and all the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.